Ultra Running Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Scotty Sando. Today, we're delving into a topic that every ultra runner should be acquainted with, overtraining syndrome. My next guest is Jill Colangelo. She's a research affiliate at the Department of Forensic Psychiatry at the University of Bern in Switzerland. She's dedicated her career to understanding the intricacies of the human body and its limits in endurance sports. She has worked with countless athletes, from beginners to elite runners, helping them navigate the fine line between pushing the limits of their body and falling victim to the detrimental effects of overtraining. Overtraining syndrome is a condition that has haunted many runners, often leading to a very frustrating halt in their training or even forcing them to, God forbid, step away from the sport that we all love. It's a phenomenon that can strike unexpectedly, leaving athletes bewildered and searching for answers. But fear not, my friends, for today, we are unraveling the mysteries surrounding this condition. In our conversation with Jill, we'll explore the signs and symptoms of overtraining syndrome and discuss why it's of the utmost importance for ultra runners to understand this condition. We'll dive into the underlying physiological mechanisms, how to differentiate it from normal fatigue and the impact it can have on both our mind and our body. Jill will also share her invaluable tips to mitigate the risk of OTS, Her insights will undoubtedly shed light on a topic that affects so many of us in the ultra running community. So whether you're a seasoned ultra runner looking to fine tune your training or a newcomer eager to embark on your first ultra venture, this episode is for you. Join us as we delve into the very important topic of OTS with the remarkable Jill Colangelo. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the show, first timer, but I have a feeling it's been the first of many appearances on this podcast. I'm so sorry it's long overdue. Jill Colangelo um, coming to us from Italy, from the coast of Italy. My goodness. Jill, last time I saw you was Western States like maybe a decade ago. It's great to see you. How are you? It is great to see you too, Scotty. It's it's uh it's it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, it's um, this is a very important topic. You know, um, we kind of spoke off air for a moment. Just typically, I talk with runners about their events, and and this is a very important topic for everyone because there may be things going on with runners in your own lives right now, which we might you might be answering a lot of questions for folks. And so, um, this interview, of course, is about overtraining syndrome um, and how it affects. Our, our bodies and and you know and very importantly our our mental health um and so let's dive in uh Jill what is we're gonna just call it OTS because it's gonna be a long ass episode <laughs> we're short on time <laughs> but uh but what is OTS yeah so overtraining syndrome is it's you know we can look at it a couple of different ways what it really is technically is a maladapted response to excessive exercise without adequate rest. That's kind of the scientific definition. Um, What it actually looks like though, is a constellation of symptoms that affect multiple body systems as a result of that not enough rest and too much training. Also, let's throw in there poor nutrition. So, you know, um, it it doesn't sound like uh, OTS is very conducive to what we do as as endurance athletes. Um, but and we and fatigue is just part of the deal, right? We all get tired. So how do you differentiate between OTS and just like exercise fatigue? Yeah, totally. So there's kind of a continuum because when we as we train for ultra marathon or really any other sport particularly endurance sport what we really need to do is we do need to kind of overreach a little bit right we need to train that's why training kind of hurts right you have to break down some tissues in order to build them back you do have to kind of extend your fitness and the way we do that is to kind of gut it out right we do the extra training we do the long hours we do the hill repeats And we feel agony the next day, and then we recover, and then we come back stronger. That's kind of how training adaptation works. But then we kind of get into a stage sometimes where we're training too much and our rest and recovery becomes inadequate. And so we sort of veer into this place where we're kind of overreaching. And people have probably heard of that term, functional overreaching, overreaching, non-functional overreaching. Um, And there's that kind of period in there where we're sort of redlining And we might start to feel those symptoms of fatigue. We might start to feel even some other types of symptoms. But if we notice it and we pull back, we can generally avoid anything 
really damaging. Um, but in the cases where we don't and we keep going or we increase our training and we don't recover enough and our nutrition is getting worse and worse because what can happen there in the middle is that as we start to go into the over, overreaching phase, we might start to feel a little tired, a little weak. And some of us will say, oh, I got to push harder. I'm being lazy. I have to get out there. And so we might actually end up increasing our training. So then we kind of have the danger of ending up in that place of overtraining syndrome. And it is not something that will ameliorate in just a couple of weeks. It's something that will really stick around for a long time. So to answer your question, that fatigue, it goes from kind of, gosh, my legs are feeling a little heavy. I'm a little tired. And then I can still bounce back in maybe a couple of days or a week of rest day to now we're into a type of fatigue that just feels bone crushing. It feels like if anyone has had COVID, really bad COVID, or if you had mono when you were a kid, um, I always kind of joke and say that if you think you're overtrained, you're probably not. If you think you're dying, you're probably overtrained. It doesn't feel like something related to your physical activity. It feels like an exhaustion that must be related to something way more serious. That's kind of where it goes. You know, that's got to be a pretty hard line for us to, you know, make the distinction between like, of, am I taking it too far? Because, you know, oftentimes some of us, I know I do, if I'm, I'm training for an endurance event and I'm telling myself, I just need to suck it up. If I can't suck it up here, I'm not gonna be able to suck it up during my event that I'm training for. Um, so we continue to push ourselves when we go, 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 go. It's on my, uh, it's on my training calendar, so I must do it and must be okay. And we sort of ignore a lot of these things that we're feeling. Um, and oftentimes, yeah, it probably is just exercise fatigue. But um, when we're talking about OTS, um, you know, what are some common signs and symptoms that folks need to look out for so they can say, yeah, this isn't this isn't just normal fatigue. This is something else. And you touched on a little bit that it is this is long term stuff, baby. Like this is you don't you do not you do not want to be in this spiral. It's like death spiral of not being able to do what it is that you've set an intention for. Yeah. And I will just say that absolutely what you described is like, we have that tendency to push ourselves because we have in our culture, right. In our, in our ultra running culture, and also in the, in our broader sense, our culture is all about that kind of push hard self-discipline, right? Like we really aspire to a lot of the things that we need to succeed in ultra running. We aspire to those characteristics as a culture. So it's really hard for us to sort of step away and take time and take rest because our endocrine system really hasn't caught up with our cultural sensibilities around discipline and pushing ourselves. So that can be really difficult. Um, so the symptoms, I will go back to what I said before, which is that it's, it's oftentimes that bone crushing fatigue that can come first. And with that, I have to say that in many of the people that I speak to, many of the athletes I counsel, many of the case studies that I review, it's kind of the psychological symptoms that seem to become overwhelming to people. And so those would be the depression, the anxiety. Um, it'll be things like uh, loss of motivation, that kind of just feeling where you don't want to get off the couch, um, lack of concentration, those types of cognitive things will come up first. Neurological things, you know, you might feel restless, kind of just like itchy, scratchy. You kind of have this feeling like you want to train, but you physically cannot do it. So you're also going to have like some pretty strong uh, physiological symptoms like bradycardia. So that's that like really slow heart rate. And by the way, just throw in a note here is that there is a difference between a healthy low heart rate because, you know, you're a trained endurance runner and the type of bradycardia that we're talking about here that is more indicative of some serious kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So you might have a decrease in appetite, weight loss. You can also have weight gain, by the way, and that can be due to water retention because of an excess of stress hormones. Um, you're going to have those like heavy, sore, stiff muscles. Your legs are going to feel like someone took hammers to them and just beat up and down your quads. Um, you will probably notice some type of sexual dysfunction. Uh, in men, you may notice that, um, as I wrote on Instagram last week, uh, Mr. Happy does not want to salute in the morning mm. for women. You may, and actually maybe also you may find difficulty with that at any time of day, women may lose their period or they may not, but they may have very irregular periods. Um, you will, may have gastrointestinal issues, headaches, difficulty maintaining body temperature. 
because the endocrine system is really the limiter here, it is the thing that sort of um, will, it takes the brunt, it, it's where uh, we notice most of OTS symptoms coming from, because as the endocrine system is affected, all the things that the endocrine system does will start to kind of go off as it tries to compensate for the amount of training that we're doing. So anything related to that will start to go awry. So um, for those who don't know, what is the endocrine system and <laughs> what does it do and why is it so important? Yeah, so it's really funny. And um, I just want to say that when I first started training for ultras way, way, way back in the day, I used to run with a group of people out in Massachusetts in Blue Hills um, and shout out to Chris Haley, my training buddy, who said one time, yeah, I only run 100 miler a year. You know, your endocrine system really isn't meant to keep up with that type of training. And I just remember that phrase going around and around and around in my head. I had no idea what it meant, of course. <laughs> so uh, it was just something that did stick in my head, though. And and so I kind of knew that there was this thing out there that I had to think about. But since it wasn't a muscle or a bone and it wasn't my lungs and it had nothing to do with my hydration pack, I had no idea what it was. So I completely understand if it's confusing. Um, so basically what happens is we have this thing, and I'll try to be general about it, it's, uh, that sort of governs everything in our body. The endocrine system is really responsible for so many different things that we do. Um, and it has a, a system of glands and hormones that are secreted. Uh, and it all has to do with just our everyday living. So it's our metabolism and it's when we wake up in the morning and it's uh, when we get a menstrual cycle and it's um, how uh, just, it's it's really everything. It's how we manage blood sugar. It's really everything that we do, maintain body temperature. There's nothing that we do that doesn't involve the endocrine system. And so it is incredibly important. It's, it's this beautiful kind of like symphony of body system, right? Because there's all these organs and glands that are moving together in, in a very symphonic way, each dependent on the other and everything depending on the time of day and what we're doing with our body. It's, it's really kind of a beautiful system. However, when we train too much and do not recover adequately, and maybe like I said, throw in that poor nutrition stuff in there, the system in our endocrine, uh, endocrine system that is meant to sort of tell us when there's danger and sort of start the stress hormone cascade, the HPA axis is there to sort of decide when we are doing too much and there's too much stress on the system. And so what ends up happening, it's, it's so that's like what we would call the neuroendocrine adaptation of a stress response. And so what happens there is that the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic, uh, sorry, hy yeah, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, will kind of get thrown off. It'll see too much stress and it'll begin to alter the function of the endocrine system. So all of those hormones, including things like cortisol and insulin and vasopressin, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, dopamine, all these things and so many more, anything that those hormones affects will start to go off. And a lot of times we use the term endocrine dysfunction, hormonal dysfunction, but the truth is, is that your, your endocrine system in that case, whenever we do weird things that make it go off, <laughs> it's actually functioning properly. What it's trying to do is return your body to the homeostasis that it loves, but it is unable to do that when we keep throwing additional training at it. So it takes this beautiful system and throws it off kilter by some of the decisions that we're making that are not great, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And it's, you know, I don't think that's something that's ever top of mind for the average runner to think about how am I taking care of something that's governing so many different parts of my body and my, and my well being. Um, because so many of those things, like one thing goes out of whack, your body starts to notice it, and then your mind starts to feel the effect. And then, you know, talk about anxiety and depression. And, you know, and if you're kind of stuck in that cycle, I mean, personally speaking, that if um, if I can't run uh, for an extended period of time, it takes a damaging toll on my mental well-being because um, I need that kind of release. I mean, we all we all need something, an outlet. And for a lot of us, we're so type A, it's so wrong. Um, but but we don't have it, and it's it's very you know it's not extreme by extreme the definition nowadays. Um, but you know it's 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 not normal and. Um, and it's if we don't have that, then our body just just you know goes out of whack. I mean, mentally, it just it's it's awful. Do you see that a lot in athletes? Well, so what you're talking about are kind of um, some of the things that we, you know we have to we have to sort of look at is kind of a chicken and an egg thing here, right? It's like, does my mental health compel me to 
exercise to this level, or is there something about exercising this at this level that throws off my mental health? You know, it uh -huh. becomes, you know, this question that we start to, and there's no answer to that, by the way, there really isn't, you know, we've, I've done some initial research, you know, on stuff like that. And it's really difficult to understand, you know, what sort of begets what that's sort of beyond the scope of the conversation. But I will say that, um, first, it's really important to me that runners begin be able to continue a, a healthy relationship with running like forever so that they can enjoy exactly what you said, which is that kind of, um, you know, stress relief where it's necessary or, or where you've become to rely on it as a healthy habit. Like my goal as a researcher and all the stuff that I do is to help people figure out how to exactly do what you're saying, which is to keep running um, in your life as a, a tool in your mental health toolbox, right? And so it's really hard for us to understand, and with many of the athletes that I work with, is that we sometimes have to do less of this thing that we love so much mm -hmm. in order for us to be able to continue to do it long term. And the truth of the matter is, is that as good as it feels in the moment, we have to really be judicious about how much of it we allow ourselves on a daily basis, because there is a possibility that if we're doing too much without adequate recovery, that we could be shortening not only our relationship with the sport, but we could be shortening our relationship with the sport, like not just for a short period of time, but for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. So we do have to be really careful about how much of it we allow ourselves um, because everyone's different, by the way, Everyone, body, everyone's body is different, but we do need to be careful about how much we do. Something that you brought up earlier, um, I want to back up the OTS bus to this. Um, you were talking about um, sort of the dysfunctions that we kind of run into with this syndrome um, and for men and women and for women about, you know, losing your period. And, um, you know, part of me feels like I hear like a whole group of women going, heck, yeah, that sounds great. Um, but that doesn't sound great. If that's part of your biology, like that's just your system doing it normally does. And if it stops, it doesn't sound good. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So hypothalamic amenorrhea is a very real threat for uh, women endurance, any, any type of endurance activity. And I want to just also say that it's not necessarily just endurance sports. It can be anyone who overexercises in any way. Um, and as a person who, I mean, and I started off because of the fact that I lost my period for five years almost, oh, you know, wow. and was in that phase of like, and I fully admit this back in the day that I was in that phase of like, this isn't so bad. You know, what do I, it's, it's fine. Like, I don't want to have kids, right? I love to run. I don't have to think about any type of hormonal fluctuations. This is great. Right. And then you start to get to a point where you get a little nervous about it. Um, but it takes a lot for you to get over that. And I will tell you this is that not getting a period is one of the most dangerous things that a woman can allow to happen to herself. And I say it like that because it's, we're very, as endurance runners, we're very much in control of that. No one wants to hear that truth, but it is true. And what can happen is long, I mean, the short term, obviously loss of fertility and stress fractures are very possible with poor nutrition and not enough estrogen. Long term, we're talking about things like cognitive decline, everyone. We're talking about uh, less protection for heart disease um, and osteoporosis, osteopenia, all of these different things that can happen to women if they allow themselves to not get a period over time. It's really dangerous. We tend to just think about, you know, hate to say it, but you know, the, the positive things, like you said, the, maybe the aesthetics of the fact that, you know, you look a certain way or feel as though, you know, your light is a feather to compete a certain way. But the truth of the matter is, is that every month that you're not getting a period, that you're not creating enough estrogen to get a period is a month that you are seriously damaging your long-term health. Wow. And you did five years of yeah. that. Holy smokes. Yeah. Did you yeah. talk to your doctor about that? Yeah. I don't want to get too personal, but if you mind sharing... Yeah, love to, honestly. So I had the same experience that a lot of my clients do. So as I said, I, you know, I, I work with either athletes dealing with hypothalamic amenorrhea or overtraining syndrome, men and women, or any gender actually uh, going through this stuff. And what happens is a lot of us will go to a doctor and doctors will, well, you have the, a spectrum of possibilities. One is that they'll try to put you on a birth control pill. 
Um, and a birth control pill, anyone will tell you, will give you a period, but it's an anovulatory cycle. So it's not ovulation. You're not creating enough estrogen. It's just giving you a bleed every month and it's really doing nothing. That sounds terrible. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. It's a very old school thing that they used to do back in the day. And I think there's still some dinosaur doctors out there that are doing it. Um, and I would hate to say, I would love to blame it on the, the, the male gynecologists out there, but I can't because there's women who do it too. So that is a red flag all, by the way, <laughs> if your gynecologist um, prescribes birth control pill because you have hypothalamic amenorrhea, like run out the door. Sorry to say that, but it's true. Um, and then other times, you know, you'll get the doctor that's like, yeah, like my doctor who I went to said, yeah, you're a skinny runner. What do you want? And I was angry. I was angry. Now, in hindsight, after I mean, Scott's face is just the jaw has dropped. Um, but in hindsight, though, she had a point. And I know this is controversial and nobody wants to hear this because everyone's like, oh, I'm trying to get my period back. No, you're either trying to get your period back or you are running at an elite level, at an endurance level, at an ultra marathon level. You really cannot do both of those things at the same time. So that's a whole other rabbit hole not to go down. Yeah, it really, that really yeah. is. That's such, but that's such an important conversation to have. And we don't have a time limit here. I don't know if you like, if things start shutting down in Italy. No, it's late over there. Nope. <laughs> I don't have a time limit. No. Okay. Um, but I mean, you talk about the kind of the, the psychological effects of this and what that has and, and, and what we we're, we're willing to put ourselves through as human beings for, to achieve a, a certain goal, by the way, it's not, we're not saving lives here, you know? Um, I love that you said that. I love that you said that. And I think that, and I will tell you this, I, I, I really love that you said that because you have like a really excellent kind of balanced idea. What you've said to me is you really need running and you love it in your life. But you've also said, you know, there's a, there's sort of a perspective on this that we need to maintain. And I, as much as I appreciate your, what you just said, I will tell you, there's a lot of people out there that don't feel the same. Um, there's a lot of people who have a, are using the sport as a maladaptive coping mechanism or something else. There's a lot of people out there that feel as though they need the sport. They need to move their bodies. It's, it's a life and death choice for them that they, and not to be too dramatic, but there's people who are quite uh, compelled into movement on a daily basis, excessive movement on a daily basis. And um, for those people trying to talk about things like moderation, trying to talk about things like, um, you know, eating more and moving less so that you can get a period, it is a very difficult, difficult decision to make. And it's a daily decision that they have to make to commit to their health. And it's very, very hard to do that. Um, the human ego is can be a dangerous thing. It, it really can. And, um, you know, it's uh, having that self-awareness, um, you know, sometimes we're the last ones to know um, just because, you know, we'd, I'm a total dolt. Like I just, <laughs> I'm often the last one to know about anything, especially when it comes to myself, um, which I think maybe brings in a pretty important conversation, uh, which is to have a conversation like, um, you know, what, like if someone's um, close friend, their running partner, even their spouse, their boyfriend, girlfriend, um, you know, what are some things that they should be keeping an eye out to notice these things? Say, you know what, I, I think maybe there's an issue here that we should maybe have you talk to someone about that. Um, you know, I heard this thing called OTS and, you know, but we, you may need some help. So what are some things to maybe that they should look out for? Um, because a lot of this stuff just feels like it is just internal where you just, they just feel it. And I mean, there are other symptoms of course, which would be, you know, you could see the outward signs of those things. Um, what are those things? And then, you know, um, what are some, maybe some tactful approaches to having that conversation? Yeah. I also want to make a distinction here between, um, overtraining syndrome and then the other side of this, which is just generally speaking, have an unhealth, having an unhealthy relationship with sport. Yeah. And yeah. that is something that we might cause a uh, call exercise dependence or exercise addiction, or, um, you know, we start going down into that zone. It may not be overtraining syndrome, but it may be that unhealthy relationship. And so those are kind of two different profiles. I'll start off with the overtraining though. I can't stress enough how ill and very sick 
the person with true overtraining syndrome will feel. So this person is not really questioning their training. That person is typically is more thinks that they have like what I've heard from, from the people that I work with, they, you know, think they have Addison's disease. They think they have cancer. They think they have, um, type one diabetes, type two diabetes. People will go in with, uh, they think they have like, you know, pernicious anemia or some type of thing. They, these people feel sick. They are quite low in mood. They are feeling depressed. They don't know what is going on. They feel like they're coming out of their skin. And what will happen is it becomes very difficult when, uh, people will, continue to try to train or they will switch to like what they think is a lesser impact sport. So classic, I'm sorry to say this classic in the ultra runner community is to like, I'm not running, but they're biking like 150 miles a week, you know? (laughs) So so like, well, it's less strain on the body. No, it's really not. You know? So, um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people that will really feel sick. And they're looking for answers and they're going to all these doctors. And of course, because OTS does not have one particular biomarker that we can point at and say, ah, yes, this blood test reveals that you have overtraining syndrome. There's really not um, any type of tried and true gold standard diagnostics for overtraining syndrome. So that really complicates the issue. And you really have to be with a physician that has even heard of the possibility that someone could get sick by training too much because- our culture is totally aligned toward the more physical activity, the better, right? In fact, the CDC's like guidelines on physical fitness are literally on their page, say the more you can do the better. Yeah. So, and, you know, American, particularly American um, medical doctors are not trained to think like, what are the possibilities if someone is doing too much? So it becomes very difficult. And unfortunately people do have to sort of advocate for themselves. They have to sort of try to educate themselves from maybe alternative sources. And by the way, this is not at all to condemn like doctors or anything. They just, no. they just get what they get for information. And this is a yeah. really complicated issue. You know, yeah, I, I think it's important to remember, I don't mean to interrupt, but <clears throat> that <clears throat> when a, you know, when an athlete walks into a doctor's office, you are more than likely an anomaly. Um, to most of the folks that they see on a, on a regular basis. This doesn't say that they aren't well-trained, whatever, Not it's not about that. But you are anomaly, you're not the norm. And when you come in and you look like you're in perfect health um, for most of us, um, well, I would say, I would say someone who has OTS is probably more than likely to look very fit than someone who doesn't. I'm sure, I don't know if I'm overgeneralizing that. Um, I'm sure it affects lots of people in different ways. Um, but generally speaking, I think that might be true. Um, and so, and you're right, you have to advocate for yourself. Like if you're not making a connection with your doctor and God forbid, if you get a dino doc, like you just said, who just doesn't like, I don't, I just don't understand what this is. You should be fine. Um, you know, it will send you down a path of, of not getting answers. And I think that is one of the harder things that you go through in life. It's when you've got a problem with your body and you don't know what it is and you can't get an answer. And when you go see professional help and they're just saying, I don't even know, like we're just like stabbing in the dark what this might be. And now you gotta go see a specialist and yada, 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 Um, you know, lots of time, energy and stress, which takes a massive toll on us as human beings, you know? And I think that's something that's very important to consider here. So when you, are hearing this interview and you are maybe thinking like, you know what, I think these folks, Jill's onto something here. I really should seek help. Um, you know, keep that in mind. So I'm sorry, I got my soapbox. No, no, that's great. I'm glad you said that. It's true. But I also want to just say that uh, there's a couple of things here. Um, I have seen people delay, uh, taking care of themselves because they continue to go from doctor to doctor because they feel like they're not getting answers. And they will point to some of the symptoms and say, um, let's say, you know, my, um, you know, my thyroid hormone is low. What's wrong with my thyroid? They'll say, I don't get a period. What's wrong with my female sex hormones? Your endocrine system in those cases is doing its job. There is no problem with your endocrine system. There is no problem with it at all. It's actually doing what it's supposed to do, given your habits. So this is like the most difficult part of this whole thing is that it's like the world's greatest self-own, right? 
in order to accept that this is what's going on, you have to accept your part in sort of making this happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really hard for people. And again, as someone who went through it, I went through it and I didn't want to believe, I didn't want to think. And back when I went through it, you know, it was still this mythical concept. Nobody knew what it was. And I know you remember Jeff Rose, right? Yeah. And you remember, and I always reference him because after he kind of like was randomly sick and stopped racing, and I'm sorry if I'm like an old lady and referencing someone that no one listening to this podcast right now knows. If you don't know who he is, God damn it. <laughs> know your yeah, history. Get on the internet, figure it out. You need to know, this, you know? So people, there was an actual article written about like this, and it, and it called it like a mysterious illness. It was scary. People didn't know what it was. They were like, oh my God, this thing is happening to me. And I just want to say, this thing is not happening to you. Y you are happening. <laughs> you mm -hmm. are doing something. You are making choices mm -hmm. that are creating this situation. And your body is not failing you. You are failing your body. I'm so sorry to say that. But that is the truth. That was very well said. Um, wow. I'm going to put that in a mug. Uh, <laughs> but it's, but it's, you it's, know, it's, 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 it's a mantra, though. Like, you are failing your body and we are that is what we're doing whenever we put it on running shoes and we're at this point of we're at this tipping point right where it is a diminished of returns right of like yeah you are the cause of your own affliction um and you have to know when to like pull the reins back and your body's telling you it's been telling you but you just don't know how to identify it yeah and you don't know how to identify it and then you don't know what to do and right. so and then we have the next part of this, which is like, what do you do, right? Which is what right. you asked. So I will say this, um, there is no amount of rest that's too much when you're that far down the rabbit hole of overtraining syndrome. There is no amount of rest that's too much. And um, unfortunately, uh, I've heard lots of crazy stories about people going to coaches and personal trainers um, or other sort of like exercise professionals and those people trying to quote, train them through overtraining syndrome mm. or making them do treadmill stress tests or, you know, advocating for particular types of diets to get them through. Oh, don't eat this. Don't eat that. You know, any type of elimination diet, those are not the answer to get through overtraining syndrome. Please do not start taking adaptogens. Please don't do that. That's not what's adaptogens. Oh, oh, this is this is another sort of gray area. Um, there's sort of these like, um, you know, unregulated, uh, let's call them, I don't even want to call them medications because they're really not, but they're sort of unregulated, let's say supplements that certain types of uh, practitioners will prescribe. I won't use the word prescribe either. Sorry. That will sort of suggest to people suffering with various different types of hormonal disruption. And they will uh, suggest that they take these different types of, again, unregulated supplements that are purported to be fixes for certain hormone imbalances, let's say, or dysfunctions. And I don't like those two words either. You can see I'm trying to dance around this. Um, and they people will start taking some of this stuff and potentially do more harm than good. So, um, and they're really unnecessary because what is necessary is a lot of rest, like more rest than you can possibly imagine. And not just sleep kind of rest, because that may be difficult for people at the beginning. They might have things like, you know, again, insomnia, night sweats, all this stuff. Really focusing on adequate nutrition, which tends to be a problem um, when we're burning the candle at both ends, literally. So adequate nutrition, starchy carbohydrates, and I mean starchy carbohydrates. This is not a time for low carb, particularly women. If you're on a low carb diet and you've lost your period, like eat a bagel. Honestly, it's that's that's what you need. Um, so a, a healthy diet consisting of all food groups. This is not the time to, I, I don't believe in clean eating. It's what you want. It's what your body wants. Eat well, rest as much as possible. Um, don't overdo things like foam rolling, but do a little bit of stretching, walking, like easy kind of stuff. And just stay off your bike. If you're a biker, stay off your get, don't start running. If you're a runner, it's just time to really sit back and allow your body to heal itself. And by the way, some of this is going to be psychological. You're going to need some psychological healing. You're going to need some physical healing. It's a long journey. I have to say it's a really long journey. So, um, I like, 
I'm at a crossroad of different questions. Uh, <laughs> first, uh, first, when it comes to the psychological, um, that means reaching out and getting some professional help potentially. Ta either, I mean, talking to friends, doing things that make you feel good. Those are good things. Self-care is important. But in addition to that, um, what are some avenues people should consider just to take care of their mental well-being in this yeah, kind of point so in time? Exactly. So I always say how people, it's important to understand how we got here, right? So how did we get to overtraining syndrome? You know, we, we know we made sort of poor decisions. And for a lot of us, some of those poor decisions come out of a necessity because what we're doing is we're, we're using training as therapy a lot of times, mm -hmm. right? And for those of us for whom that is true, and by the mm -hmm. way, again, that's not everybody, but let's say if that's true for you, you have to remember that running should just be a tool in your toolbox. It's a great adjunct to mental health care, but it is should not be your only source of mental health care because, and I've said this before too, you're asking that sport to carry a very heavy burden that it can easily break under the weight of that burden. So if you are going through overtraining syndrome and you can no longer do the thing that you want to do the most, um, this is the time to diversify your sort of toolbox of mental health care. So if that's seeing a mental health healthcare practitioner, if that's reaching out to family and friends, if that is um, engaging with other activities that bring you joy and that is going to take some time to figure out, it's not going to happen in a minute, um, to getting yourself to really reflect on your self-worth and value as a person, because this is one of the major issues, and especially in our community. A lot of us, a lot of us really are very closely identified with the idea of being an ultra runner, right? And we think, if I am not training every day, I am not an ultra runner. And if I don't feel like an ultra runner, I don't feel good. I don't feel like myself. A lot of my value, my self-esteem, my self-worth. I used to say, I used to think that honestly, my ability to run long was like one of the best characteristics about me. I thought it really said a lot about who I was as a person. And I really, really was one of those people that was very, very tightly um, connected to that identity. And that is a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong, but it can also hold you back because it can be the thing that can, makes you continue to make the choice to train when your body really needs that rest. So um, multi-pronged approach. I had, you know, I've had people that I've worked with do things like, you know, take a language class, um, you know, go back to school, write a book. I mean, really kind of wild stuff as they're trying to sort of find who they are in a different way. And it's not that you're never going to go back to running. You you may come back to running in a different way. It's just that when you do, you want to be stronger all the way around for it. And part of that is figuring out who you are, all the wonderful things about you that running is a part of, but that also encompass so many other aspects of your personality. You know, um, I'm so glad we're talking about this. It's for so many different reasons. And, you know, um, when we there is a you know a certain kind of group within the ultra running community where like if they came out of um, an addiction to something and they've supplemented their addiction with ultra running versus to get away from a vice right whatever it is doesn't matter um but the the pitfalls that exist out there for something like ots and perhaps you kind of come from a background where you had a monkey you got off your back and you got ultra running on there now, and that's gone, that you could potentially backslide into the thing that, you know, you got away from. Um, and it doesn't sound like OTS is just like, oh, I'm going to just take a week off. I'll be fine. It sounds very long term. Um, well, it can be long term. I don't want to put it into a box because I don't know. I'm talking to you about OTS because I don't know a thing about it. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's so important that we're having a conversation. Um, so that's why it, it, it's so important to get that a healthy balance in there if you're going through this to to fill your cup with something good. Um, but, you know, a lot of us, we don't have those coping mechanisms in place to be able to take care of ourselves. And we do slide into things that could be bad habits or again, ego is a really tough thing of, I can't do this. It defines who I am. I guess I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I make bad choices. Oh my gosh, this is, you know, that's a real thing. Um, and so then you can see how those vices kind of come back into play. 
Um, so when we look at OTS, um, what in terms of recovery, what are we looking at? Like, what is a, what is the the long term, short term effects of it, and you know, what is the recovery like for this? Yeah, it really depends on the person. I will say it's very individual. I knew you probably knew I was going to say that. I um, wanted one answer. I wanted like Scotty, it's like a week, and you're good to go. <laughs> Just like you know, a week and a half, you're fine. Just yeah. <laughs> It's no big deal. No, big deal. no I, it really depends on the person. Um, it depends on how committed you are to kind of doing the thing that sucks the most, which is not running. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a way to sort of like think about this. The, the torture of not running at the beginning is, you know, you, you will be well served by a shortened recovery time, right? That is what we hope we hope comes out of the 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 rest period at the beginning. But there's no guarantee that someone is going to like look at their calendar and say, ah, oh, yes, let me just clear the next three months to not do anything. So when people start to sort of hedge on it or they start to try to push their bodies. Now, I'll be honest with you. Again, we're not talking about exercise dependence here. We're talking about overtraining syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it is highly likely that someone in that state is not going to even be able to finish like a 6K run. Like that person is going from um, a place where they're, let's say doing, uh, a, a marathon as a training run. Right. And maybe their legs are a little cranky the next day to like a half marathon. They can barely finish to a 10 K they can barely finish to a 5k run feels like torture. So this person is not going to really be hot to go, you know, pack the miles in this person's going to really kind of be suffering anyway, on the off chance that they can get their body to move as, as long as, you know, 10 K, um, it is highly likely that symptoms will come back. It, it's highly likely your body will let you know, and you will likely start with the night sweats again, and you'll probably have trouble sleeping again. And you will probably have those weird, like fatigue things, uh, that sort of hit you in the middle of the day. And you feel like you need to lay down and you're going to stand up from a seated position and see black spots everywhere. And it's going to kind of head back. And I will say that unfortunately or fortunately, and you know, this is why this stuff is so important is that if you have gone through true overtraining syndrome, chances are the ceiling is going to be lower for what you can do moving forward, mm. because it's just going to be, you kind of flamed out your endocrine system. Now I know that's, it's not a popular opinion to think that it's not going to come back. It will it may not come back the way it did. And also if you start to feel symptoms again, it may be you who decides to be the limiter on, you know, I'm just not going to return to that place again. And if I, I've had people that have gone through this more than one time, pretty severely. And, you know, at that point, it's really difficult to see how long now a recovery will take from like two bouts of this. So my advice is, you know, get ready, settle in, you know, pick something to binge on Netflix. No, I'm, I'm being flippant, but it really is a long, a longer term. Um, it's a longer term recovery. And it is really important that you really push yourself the opposite way. See, I used to think that me being able to push myself to run so many miles meant that I was tough, but I didn't realize that it's more tough to be judicious and careful about your training long-term. That's way tougher. So if someone um, feels that maybe they have OTS and they're going to go see their, their GP, um, what are some questions that they should have ready to go when they have that appointment? Yeah, um, it's, it's, again, it's a little bit difficult. I think what they really want to do instead of questions, I think what they want to do is they want to inform their physician and be very clear about the number of training hours that they put in a week. And it's not just the um, training hours of, you know, just the running. It's also all the supplemental stuff you might be doing. Um, it may also be, you know, all of the extra activity that you don't realize is kind of like that non-exercise movement that is really adding up. You want to let this doctor know how much you've been training and for how long you've been training. You also really want to be honest about some of your dietary stuff. Like we didn't really talk about it much, but being honest, if you are on, if you are doing anything kind of not normal in your diet. And again, I don't want to point any fingers or use any words, but no, go ahead. Point fingers. I'm all about <laughs> it. I'm, I'm kidding. 
but I really if you am. have cut out entire food groups or entire categories of foods, or if you have cut out entire macronutrient groups, um, you need to let your doctor know about this. And you need to also just, you just need to be upfront and clear about how much you've been doing. And don't be surprised if you get some blank looks because they may still not understand exactly what that means. And there's a very easy reason for that. And it's, again, it's totally not their fault. It's that we have a lot of data out there in medical science about people who are sedentary, right? We know what happens if someone does nothing. We're very, very aware of what happens there. And we say, okay, if someone does nothing and they're gonna incur all of these health effects, right? But we have no idea what happens when you do this much sport, this much exercise, you know, it is my contention that there's a U-shaped curve there, right? So it's like doing nothing is terrible. Doing so much that you've broken your endocrine system is also terrible and that there's a sweet spot in the middle. Um, so don't be surprised if your physician, your GP, even if it's someone that you've been with for a long time, don't be surprised if they don't really know what to do with you, mm -hmm. but you're gonna be okay. Just because they don't know exactly how to sort of categorize or what to tell you, you are going to be okay. Them not really having enough information about this doesn't mean that there's something scary wrong with you if, if that's what we're talking about. So um, it does mean though that it's, it's kind of on you to take care of what you need to take care of in order to heal. You might not have like the best, um, you know, medical advice where you are again, depending on where you are and who you're talking to, but you are, it doesn't mean that you're in danger. You're going to be okay. So, um, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by the endocrine system because it's not something that I think the average person spends a lot of time thinking about. You did. Someone uh, on a training run told you, I don't do, only do 100 because you can take care of my endocrine system. Um, what are things that we can do to help take care of our, what does it need? What does the okay. system need? How do we take care of it? How do we nurture this? I love this question. This is the best question. Okay. So here's something fun about the endocrine system. There's so many things. I love it so much. It's like, like I said, it's like a symphony orchestra. So you think of it all together and you think of how it all works. And one of the coolest, but also terrible things about the endocrine system is that it cannot tell the difference between all the different types of stresses in your life. It has no idea. So you running a 10 mile run and getting in a traffic jam and having to study for exams and going through a divorce and getting sick, like getting the flu or something, it's all the same. It doesn't understand the difference. And so one of the most important things that you can do is you can look at the sum total of stress in your life and really take stock. So on a day where let's say you uh, were in a two hour traffic jam, you didn't have lunch, you got in a fight with your significant other, and now you want to go home and run a 10 mile run and you already have a headache and you're dehydrated, right? That I wouldn't go on a 10 mile run there because again, that 10 mile run at that point may just be additive to the stress, maybe two miles, maybe three miles, right? Just to kind of blow the smoke out of your head and maybe cool down a little bit, but that's not the time for a long run. Okay. Very unpopular opinion, but it's true. And by the way, I just want to mention that all of the data, pretty much all of the data that we have on the, the mental health, like ameliorative effects of physical exercise are like 120 to 150 minutes of zone two aerobic exercise per week. So we're not talking ultra marathon training. We're talking like basics of, you know, a nice chill, like jog or a nice chill bike ride or a nice walk. So you can still get those mental health effects, which with much less on a day where your overall stress level is too high. So that's the first thing. Consider your overall stress level. That's really important. It's important to think about all the different aspects of your life. Some of the other things that are important are the basics, you know, good nutrition and sleep. And again, I cannot stress enough things like starchy carbohydrates, particularly for women who get a period and should be getting a period. You know, we have to get to a place where we're willing to put aside things like body image and aesthetics. And by the way, I mean that for men and women and any gender you might happen to be, we need to be able to separate that from what is actually right for our body and how it's going to function. So those things are really important. Um, it's also just really important that we periodize training. That is something so, you know, basic. I remember back in the day when I first started running marathons, you remember like the Hal Higdon Bible of like marathon running? Remember that? I had it. <laughs> See, I am old. We are old. So, but that periodized training, right? 
we had times of the year where we did a lot of training times of the year where we took some time, we took it off, right? The meso macro uh, micro cycles of training, the time off. We got to go back to that. We really have to think about that periodization of training because again, your body isn't meant to put out that much output all year long. If your like training data is like a flat plateau, or if it's just an upward climb forever in, across a year, like that's not good. You need some ups and downs in there. You need some periods where you just do a little bit less. That's really just basics, just basic good training kind of principles. Um, and honestly, you have to, <laughs> and I say this as someone who, again, this is back in the day before like, uh, you know, Strava, where we were all like looking at each other on ultra sign up instead. Remember that? Oh yeah. And pulling the trigger at two o'clock in the morning for like some ridiculous race that we're like, what it never happened never happened right <laughs> no so definitely consider your race schedule across a year you know and this is also something unpopular but just because there's many more races now than there were like 10 15 years ago does not mean you have to do all of them you still have to be really careful about how you plan your season don't throw in extra races just because your friends are going, you know, don't throw in extra races just because like you're going on vacation and that that town that you uh, are going to visit happens to have a race. <laughs> Gee, I, I never did that before. Right. I mean, stuff like that. Just, you know, you got to be careful about how much you're um, how much you're adding to your season. Those things are really important. So. The other side of this, well, you you mentioned it. Um with uh, you know starchy foods, especially for women, um, nutrition and the endocrine system. Um, what is that balance? What's a typical balance for that? You mean actual like macronutrient breakdown, that kind of thing? Yeah. I cannot answer that because it's gonna be different for everyone. Um, but here's what I will tell you. Uh, you need to eat more food than you think. If I could tell any runner a piece of advice, it would be that you need to eat more than you think you do. Um, and that is something that I certainly did not want to hear back in the day. I, you know, remember the, the everyone was like, oh, I'm going to be fat adapted, you know, and then everyone's eating like, you know, avocados on the trail. Yeah, no, there's just, that's not going to work. It's really not going to work. We all Sorry. know somebody, we all know somebody. We all know somebody, you know? Oh God. I know. I remember all, I remember doing that, you know, like thinking like, oh, I can, I can become, no, you're not just don't do weird stuff. As my friend Kirsten Screen says all the time, she's a registered dietitian. She says, you know, don't do weird stuff with your, with your diet. And it's true. The basics really do prevail. Um, now I'm not talking about things like, you know, the old school carb loading and things like that. It's not that, but we have had so many incredible advances in nutrition, um, over the years. And what we know is much more than just, you know, drop out an entire macronutrient group to improve your performance. So <clears throat> I will say this, if you need nutritional support, people think that just because that they know how to eat, that they know how to feed themselves. Those are two different things. And if you need to speak to someone, I highly recommend that you see a registered dietitian. I'm going to say that again, a registered dietitian. And there's a um, database of that in the U.S. where you can access and find someone who is a registered dietitian. Try to look for someone who is a non-weight loss registered dietitian because that's not what you need. You don't need to worry about your body composition, although those things can shift with proper nutrition, but you need to fuel yourself properly. And that, um, is a choice. You can either sometimes look like an endurance runner, or you can be an endurance runner mm. sometimes are not the same thing. So nutrition is super important. And I highly, highly, highly suggest that you talk to someone who knows their, you know, what, before you make decisions that are not going to support you. <clears throat> your body is not failing you. You are failing your body. Um, that is my new mantra, Jill. Jill, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? And uh, what sorts what sorts of services do you offer? Yeah. So um just by uh you can find me on Instagram. It's uh Jill Colangelo Psych, P-S-Y-C-H. Um, you can find me there. I also have a website, it's jillcolangelo.com. So I'll tell you what I do. So two things. Number one, my bread and butter is I am a researcher at the University of Bern in the Department of Forensic Psychiatry. And that sounds scary, but we do a lot of work that overlaps between forensics and sports psychiatry. Sports psychiatry is um, 
is really where my heart lies. And I love doing that research and there'll be more coming from there. And my, again, my goal is just to make people as healthy and long-term athletes as possible. So that's where most of my work goes. But in addition to that, I um, do what I would call mentoring support, uh, sort of question answering and sort of walking through scenarios with people, endurance athletes or otherwise, doesn't matter where you are, where you come from. If you have questions about anything that we talked about today, if you're curious about overtraining syndrome or hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, I do mentoring calls. So it's on my website, jillcolangelo.com, and you can schedule there. You can also email me through there. If you just want to ask me a quick question, I usually try to respond to people. I'll put the link in the description. Jill, thank you so much for the conversation. It's educational. I hope that it answers a lot of questions for people. I hope this doesn't happen to folks, but you know, inevitably it's 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 hurting somebody. And I hope now they can get some help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scotty. You got it. Let's do it again.